Mr. Secretary General, dear Mr. Ban Ki-moon, dear Mrs. Uh, Bang Sun Tech, on behalf of the Graduate Institute, the Swiss Forum for International Affairs, and the Diplomatic Club of Geneva, welcome in this house of peace. We are extremely honored that you found time in your extremely tight schedule to speak to our audience here at the Institute. We had the privilege to listen to your remarks at lunchtime under Chatham House rules. You were very open, self-critical of the UN system, but also you showed us the positive steps during your very efficient tenure. After your speech, you kindly agreed to have a short discussion with our two animators, Professor Elisabeth Prügel. Elisabeth is Professor of International Relations at the Graduate Institute, where she directs the Institute Gender Center. She has published extensively on issues of international governance and is member of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network. Xavier Collin is journalist, former editor-in-chief of TV5 Monde, producer and presenter of uh, international news program at the Swiss television with Geopolitics, and is fellow at the Center for Security Policy uh, here in Geneva. Finally, dear Secretary General, you have accepted to take a few questions from the audience, especially from the students. You have here uh, mainly an audience of young people from the Graduate Institute, from the university, these students are coming from all over the world, and they are also among them, you will find future leaders in politics, economics, but also in the academic world and the culture world. And they need hope, and they need light. Let me conclude with a quote, a citation. During your Geneva farewell tour, we'll heard a lot of quotes. I will take one from another register from Saint-Exupéry, who said, uh, today's utopia is tomorrow's reality. There is no alternative to the hard and sensitive work of the UN, and there is no alternative to optimism. You concluded your final address at this year General Assembly with the following words. A peace a perfect world may be on the far horizon, but a route to a better world, a more just world, is in each and every one of us. It's a perfect conclusion, but also a perfect introduction to speak to young people. And we are not always confident in the future when we look around us. Mr. Secretary General, Make us confident, give us confidence, and give us a sense of hope. You have the floor. Monsieur l'ambassadeur Raymond Loretan, président du club diplomatique de Genève, Monsieur l'ambassadeur Bertrand Louis, président du Forum Suisse de politique internationale, Monsieur Rolf Soiron, président de l'Institut des hautes études internationales et du développement, Monsieur Philippe Burin, directeur de l'Institut 
the Haute Études Internationales et du Développement, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs les membres du corps diplomatique, Mesdames et Messieurs les membres du corps enseignant, chers étudiants, Mesdames et Messieurs, bonsoir, je suis très heureux d'être ici parmi vous ce soir. Merci de votre accueil très chaleureux. Je tiens tout d'abord à remercier les organisations de cette manifestation. Le club diplomatique, le Forum suisse et l'Institut de hautes études. C'est la 42e fois que je me rends en Suisse en 10 ans, soit une fois toutes les 14 semaines en moyenne. Cela fait de Genève ma destination la plus fréquente de loin et ce pour de bonnes raisons. C'est en effet d'ici que l'ONU orchestre les actions humanitaires menées dans le monde entier qui ont atteint un niveau record depuis la création de l'Organisation des Nations Unies. C'est ici et que nous exhortons le gouvernement à respecter les droits de l'homme et que nous nous faisons les porte-parole des victimes lorsqu'ils ont besoin de justice. Et c'est ici, ici que l'ONU mobilise les énergies à l'échelle mondiale pour promouvoir la santé publique l'amélioration des conditions de travail et le commerce équitable, ainsi que pour atteindre nombre d'autres objectifs cruciaux. Je saisis donc cette occasion pour vous remercier de vos, de vos contributions et pour vous parler de ce que j'ai tenté d'accomplir en ma qualité de secrétaire général de l'ONU ainsi que pour vous suggérer quelques moyens d'appuyer au mieux mon successeur. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is my first European trip immediately after my report to the General Assembly last week. In the course of just a few days, I took part in 74 events and held 126 bilaterals with the President and Prime Ministers in just a week. 200 engagement in just a week. I call it a diplomatic equivalent of speed dating. <laughs> there was not even one minute or two minutes uh, pause. Meeting all the times. Things are very rushed, but the period does <coughs> provide an opportunity to take the pulse of the world. You have to check your pulse. This is a period of uncommon volatility and unconscionable suffering. 135 million people need life-saving assistance daily by the United Nations. 65 million people, they are either refugees or migrants. This is the highest number of people of refugees since the end of Second World War. Only during the Second World War, we had that many number of people. These numbers are unsustainable, unmanageable. Their implications put our future at risk. Yet this is also a period of opportunity uh, to secure a better future for all. The landmark Paris Agreement on Climate Change is expected to enter into force in the days ahead. Consider how far we have come. Climate deniers, climate uh, deniers, skeptics have been utterly discredited now. Their ever diminishing ranks are blind to science and on the wrong side of history. We have already passed one key threshold. 62 ratifications have joined, 
62 countries have joined the Paris Agreement legally. Well over 55 stipulated by the agreement as one of the two triggers for entry into force. In the days ahead, we are expected to cross the second threshold, the 55% of greenhouse gas emissions. We have reached 47.5%. We are lacking 7.5% now. Yesterday, India has joined. Now it has reduced 4.1%. Now we have, as of now, 3. Point, how many? 4%, 3.4% to go to get it entry into force. Few thought such a speedy entry into force would be possible, but it reflects the growing global determination to tackle this climate change phenomenon. The world also has an inspiring new manifesto. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals with 17 goals, what we call SDGs. This is a success of MDGs, but much broader, much more comprehensive, much more ambitious and far-reaching ambitions than MDGs. This SDGs, please remember, this will be your guide and our guide. And we have to move toward that direction. The agenda is our plan for ending poverty and ensuring the lives of peace and dignity on a healthy planet. I can tell you in a very uh, easier way, you can memorize a five Ps. These SDGs and climate change are for the people, for the planet, in peace and prosperity through global partnership. Peace, people, planet, peace, prosperity, partnership. These all five Ps will make all the people and our planet, only planet, on a sustainable path. This, please remember this. About the poverty eradication, we really tried during last 15 years through MDG we have reduced half of the population who are living on, with just one dollar, less than one dollar. But because of continuing financial crisis, it has pushed another 100 million people into the ranks of poverty. Our aim is to get all these people out of extreme poverty. I think we can do it. By 2050, we we'll make sure that this planet Earth will be 50-50 in gender equality. By 50-50, there will be no person who will be dying needlessly from preventable diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS. <coughs> Countries and communities and citizens across the world are mobilizing behind these 17 sustainable development goals. Geneva has a key role to play in this work, and I will count on your strong commitment and engagement on this matter. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is also some encouraging news to report in our work to advance peace and security in Myanmar. The transition has entered a promising phase. Under the leadership of Do Aung San Suu Kyi, who is the leader of this the first ever civilian government, they're making great contribution and progress, even though there are still some remaining issues of human rights of Rohingyas in the Rakhine state. I was there last month. In Sri Lanka, after 30 years of uh, civil war, now they are making great uh, reconciliatory uh, process on peace building. I was there too last month. I fully, strongly encouraged the leaders of these two countries to move on. And I have assured strong United Nations engagement and support. I told them that there, there is a will. If there are political wills, 
there are ways to resolve all these long standing uh, problems. We need to find that the will to address uh, several emergencies that are darkening the days of millions from Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, Central African Republic, Afghanistan, Lake Chad Basin. There are many fires are burning at this time. At least 17 fires, big or small, are burning at this moment. If we count frozen conflict, frozen neglected, con neglected diseases, and forgotten crisis, I think there are much more, 35 or 30, almost 40. But we have to put out all these burning fires. Unfortunately, this Syrian crisis has been continuing six years. Six years. 4.5 million people have become refugees. They're living in Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. 12 million people out of 22. That means 4.5, 12 million people, they need urgent, life-saving humanitarian assistance at this time. 60, 70 percent of infrastructure have been destroyed. No schools, no hospitals. This is a huge problem, particularly the situation in Aleppo, which is continuing. That's a heartbreaking. That's a heartbreaking, and you cannot just see without crying. You must see every day. This is totally unacceptable. Just a few days ago at the Security Council, I have made the strongest statement urging the Security Council members to unite and to address with political wills. The government of Syria, they are now using barrel bombs. They have already used the chemical weapons. And some countries are using bunker busting bombs. And these bunker busting bombs are just, they can be manufactured by very small number of big powers. Now, which countries are using this bunker busting? Then there are virtually no place to hide when these bombs penetrate two, three meters under the, under the ground. This is a very serious uh, situation. What started as a conflict solely about Syria has become an arena for regional rivalry and big power competition. These proxy wars, proxy battles, have drawn in foreign fighters like Gamoth to a flame while consuming Syrians in the fire. The divisions in Syria, among Syrian people, divisions in the region, Arab region, divisions in the Security Council have made a perfect storm where ISIS, extremists, terrorists, they have deeply rooted. That is something which we have to address and defeat through global solidarity. That's what the United Nations is very much committed. I urge the Security Council to do much more to end this fighting. Talks toward the political transition are long overdue. The Syrian conflict has helped to feed sectarianism, radicalism, radicalization. Violent extremists continue to commit appalling acts and to prey on vulnerable people. Our challenge remains to respond in measured ways that do not play into their narratives. The Syrian conflict has also added millions of refugees and displaced people. As I said, 4.5 million people. I have visited all these four refugee camps, at least twice, and I met all of them. Particularly what's heartbreaking is to meet so many young students, young people, teens, who should be studying hard at the schools at this time. Two weeks ago, at the United Nations, we convened a summit meeting on refugees and migrants. Because this has not been resolved by regional powers, particularly in Europe, I decided to bring it to 
a global level at the United Nations. There was another summit meeting which was convened together with the President Obama and myself and some other six more countries co-sponsored. And we agreed and adopted New York Declaration on migrants and refugees on the basis of which we will have a global compact to resolve this issue on a principle of global responsibility sharing. Not a single country, however powerful, however resourceful one may be, like the United States or European countries, they cannot do it alone. United Nations, the most universal international organization, we cannot handle without solidarity, without compassion of all the people involved. We need more countries to resettle more people in their countries. I know there can be tensions and difficulties, and discrimination xenophobia, particularly based on ethnicities and women and girls. Those minority group of people uh, have become more targets and prey of extremist and violent and discriminations. We have to stand up against xenophobia. Faced by so many refugees and migrants, I'm deeply troubled by political rhetoric, by the political leaders. They use very abusive, unacceptable languages. Particularly in Europe, where democratic rules, good governance, and most affluent societies, they should, have been, they, they should have done much more. We must reject the dangerous, dangerous political math that says you, add, you can add votes by dividing people. That's wrong. The United Nations has just launched a campaign against this poison, what I call poison. It is designed to foster communities of inclusion and mutual respect, and we call it simply together, together for human dignity and inclusiveness. Mesdames et Messieurs, Excellence, pendant les dix ans où j'ai exercé les fonctions de secrétaire général des Nations Unies, je me suis efforcé de faire en sorte que l'ONU soit à même de monnaie à bien les tâches et de relever les défis de notre époque. Les demandes, les demandes auxquelles doit répondre l'ONU n'ont cessé de croître et la situation sur le plan de la sécurité est plus complexe qu'auparavant. Les besoins humanitaires ont été multipliés par douze du fait principalement des conflits armés. Mais nous n'avons pu y répondre qu'à moitié. De nombreux gouvernements exercent une répression sur les médias et la société civile, et trop de dirigeants manipulent les constitutions pour conserver leur pouvoir. Nous continuons par ailleurs d'être témoins de dangereuses divisions en particulier au sein du Conseil de sécurité qui s'est montré honteusement désuni sur des questions de vie ou de mort. Dans le même temps, la communauté internationale s'est unie comme jamais auparavant pour lutter contre les changements climatiques et réaliser les objectifs de développement durable, ODT. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for my part as a Secretary General, I have sought to place greater emphasis on human rights and the empowerment of women. Empowerment of women has been one of top priorities together with the climate change and sustainable development during my mandate as a Secretary General. I have strived to get member states to focus on conflict prevention including through a plan of action to address 
the underlying drivers of violent extremism. We are also tapping the energies of young people. I'm pleased to see so many students today here this evening. Politicians and professors often call you the leaders of tomorrow. But I say you are already the leaders we need today. Many of you have taken part as a leader of this society. Look at the case of very young, poor man in Tunisia. You may remember his name, Muhammad Bouazizi. He was just a street vendor. His anger triggered this Arab Spring. It has given strong message to the leaders in the region. I have been speaking to the leaders. Listen carefully and sincerely to the voices of young people, what their aspirations and challenges are. If you do not listen to the voices of them, you will never be a leader and inclusive leader. Two weeks ago, we named the first, first class of 17 young leaders for the Sustainable Development Goals. We have tasked them one goal each, one person. These men and women are doing outstanding work in their communities and will now help us to mobilize their peers across the world. The United Nations is strongly committed to working not just for youth, but with youth. This is what I can repeat now. When I was elected for second term in 2012, uh, five years ago, I made it as one of my top five priorities, working for women and with women, working for and with women, and working for youth and with youth. A lot of people, a lot of leaders have been talking about women, women's issues, but not much about youth. For the first time in the history, I have appointed special envoy for youth, who was at that time 28 years old, senior most. And recently, I have appointed former Austrian chancellor, Austrian prime minister, as my special envoy for youth employment. There are 70 million young people out of jobs. Just imagine when these 70 million people without anything to do, just wander around, they easily become prey of extremists and terrorists. If not drug dealers and criminals, they become easy, easily fall into temptations of these crimes. So we have to do much more for youth employment. Now I'm telling you, the young people, you have prerogative. You can be as passionate as you can. It's your prerogative. You're, you can be ambitious. At the same time, I'm telling you, have a compassion too. If you have only passion, you may not know where you are going. When it is supported with the compassion, that means you have become a global citizen. This world is very small. Just forget about Switzerland or European countries. These national boundaries do not mean much these days. We are living in a small, small planet. Whatever I'm now saying is, has already been communicated within a blink of, within a fraction of a second. We are living in global communication, social media. Therefore, there is no national boundaries. Be a global citizen. And let us try to see what you can do for others. When uh, I was, uh, we have a lot of uh, my uh, former friends of uh, called Red Cross alumni. Uh, we were, uh, I'm very glad that some of my friends, about 45 friends are among this 
audience, 1962, we all went to the United States and had an opportunity of meeting John F. Kennedy at that time. This all uh, young teens from 40 some countries, 120 of us, we are 45 here, including family members. At that time, President Kennedy told us, it's a height of a Cold War, where leaders and countries do not get along well. What you can do, since you are young, the national boundaries, he already said, you can check White House archives, national boundaries do not mean much. It's a question whether you are ready to extend your helping hands to other people. This is what we have to do. Then, that is what I'm saying, the compassion. You have to have compassion, you have to have a global vision, global citizenship. This is what I'm asking young people. You are part of this process with the current leaders. I'm leaving within three months time. I'll join civil society. But it's now next, your turn. Be ready to take charge of this world. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is an exceptionally difficult period for the world. And the monumentally challenging for the international community. Yet I believe we can be optimistic about our better future. While we may be troubled living in this world of perils and challenges and fires, but we have a good ambitions, good visions, sustainable development, climate change, global citizenships. I think with this, we can make this world better for where nobody will be left behind. Let's work together. Can you promise? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Please have a seat. Do, do I need to tell you that you're at home? Don't feel home. You're at home. Geneva is the home of all Secretary Generals. And as you mentioned, you've been visiting us several times. Sir, look at the audience. You were telling this younger generation about passion and compassion. After all, in this very room, maybe you have, not the next, but one of the future Secretary Generals of the United Nations. Are there any candidates? Any candidates? Raise your hand. And if you want to be the next one, well, you have to hurry up because the deadline is sometime like something like tomorrow. Okay. Sir, at this very moment, while we are sitting and talking comfortably, as you mentioned, people are dying by the thousands in Syria. We'll start with this. Professor Pergon, you have the floor for your questions. Remember, people, we will have questions from the floor in a while. I will ask you to identify yourself and please do not make long statements. We want quick questions. May I ask you to make quick answers? Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Prigel, yours. I'll Go try ahead. To set the model. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. Um, you have spoken, I think, uh, for many of us uh, when you have been condemning the situation in Syria in recent weeks. Um, but in the end, Syria also represents a massive failure of the United Nations. Um, and I understand that a lot of this has to do with disagreement within the P5. Mm -hmm. But what, why have you not been able to do anything about this as a Secretary General? What, what exactly is the relationship of the Office of the Secretary General to the P5? Can the Office influence the P5? Now, 
In principle, since this is an international organization, United Nations, everybody should bring the global vision for the global interest. But the tendency is that all the member states bring their own national perspectives and try to address issues on a national interest basis. That's the beginning of division. They cannot agree on that. Then it's only the people who suffer. This is what I say. I've been meeting P5 ambassadors quite frequently on this issue. And I have appointed the special envoys, three special envoys until now, the Kofi Annan, my predecessor, and Lakta Brahimi, one of the best uh, uh, experienced diplomat. Now, Stefan Demistra, another best uh, diplomat. It's not the lack of diplomatic capacity of these envoys, it's not lack of my political will or the Secretary General's inability to do that is a division and based on national interest. Interest, yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. May I follow up on this? You said in French just a while ago, nous continuons par ailleurs d'être témoins de dangereuses divisions, en particulier au sein de conseils de sécurité qui s'est montré honteusement désunis sur des questions de vie. Did you tell those diplomats that it was a shame? Yes, I did. I did many times. Yeah. I, I really issued uh, this is utterly unacceptable uh, situation. Show your unity. Show your unity. I talked to uh, P5 on even most recently, September 28th. I did in front of public public meeting. The the New York Times or some other newspapers described that. They have seen me the most angry and the most seriously and strongest of terms. That that's what I have been saying. Yeah. How do you look when you're angry? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. I tell that for the photographs. Uh, let's uh, let's yeah. be very serious. You do have a question about gender situation, which question. is something you mentioned. Right. I do have a question about gender, and thank you very much for pointing out uh, the, the various uh, uh, accomplishments that have uh, been made uh, in the UN under your leadership. You are well known as championing uh, women's rights and gender equality. Um, yet, despite your leadership on the matter, the overall record of the UN uh, is still severely wanting. Uh, the percentage of women in top management within the Secretariat has uh, reached not even 25%, even though the uh, target already for 2000 was 30%. So this is going uh, incredibly slow. And even if we look at the discussions about the women secretary general that we all would want, mm -hmm. the candidates no uh, names, seem please. to be uh, at the bottom of the list at this point. So what, what explains the disconnect with the core UN value, namely gender equality and actual press, uh, practice? Is the UN uh, in the end a patriarchal yeah. institution after all? You may, uh, you may see me uh, being a Korean <clears throat> I have been raised in a very you know, highly male-dominant society under complete Confucius uh, uh, teachings. Uh, I was raised under that uh, circumstances. But as a Secretary General and as a minister, I have been opening up my ears and voices that this world the half the sky, half the sky, there are women, even more women, then there should be equal opportunities for women, if not more. That has really has driven me to change, try to change this uh, gender uh, circumstance issues. I first tried to lead by example. First, I wanted to do better in my, in my you know, uh, secretariat. With a lot of resistance, difficulties, I have been able to appoint at the senior level, under Secretary General, or Assistant Secretary General, 
much more women, much more women. In terms of number of appointments, more than 120 appointments, more than 120 appointments. Still, we have to do more. It reached about 40% or so. For example, before I came, there were seven secretaries general. The women who who was who were appointed during seven by seven secretary generals, I appointed much more women than all seven secretary generals appointment combined. Then for the first time, just to break this glass ceiling, I appointed the first woman force commander. And people said the women, you know, they are not able to control these soldiers. But I did once. People say that uh, women are not capable of uh, managing this mission with their political mission, military, and all development, all the comprehensive sort of a small government. I appointed until now seven women as such, such positions, and I have been breaking this one. After breaking glass ceiling in the United Nations, I reached out to the world. I've been trying to really sometimes by humiliation, humi humiliating the world leaders. For example, I've been checking all the records. When I was appointed, there were 10 countries in the world where not a single woman was represented at the parliament. I just checked, there are at least six of you here where in your countries no woman is represented in the Parliament. I've been just reducing all this number. Now we have um, five, or s just the maximum five, now four. Uh, it reduced once. Then cabinet members, cabinet members. There are eight countries in the world now where not a single woman is a minister in the cabinet. I've been just trying to uh, straight talk to them. By doing that, I have changed a lot, a lot. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the, back to the refugee or migrant issue. May I recall the younger generation that yourself, sir, have been a displaced yeah, yeah. child yeah, yeah. several decades ago, so you know what, what the talk is about. Tell us about Europe in the sense of xenophobia that you mentioned just a while ago. Europe more than any other part of the world? The my my situation was different. Korea is a quite homogeneous country. Therefore, uh, we were difficult, living in a very difficult. I was uh, displaced when I was uh, six years old. In Korean War, Korean War broke out in 1950. So we had to uh, flee to a safer place at a very deep uh, mountain site where no North Koreans, even South Koreans could ever come because uh, there were no roads. And so we were more or less uh, safe, but there was nothing to eat. I saw my grandparents, a grandfather, my father were running here and there to find something to eat. At that time, the United Nations came with the troops, all this assistance. Even later, they brought the toys and textbooks. And so I'm the beneficiaries of the United Nations. After Six decades, same things are still happening around the world. So I, whenever I was meeting with them, when I was a poor, when I was a displaced person, United Nations was with me. Because of that, I'll make sure that United Nations will be with you. So this is a sense of um, commitment to giving some hope. Now, xenophobia, particularly in European countries where all different ethnic uh, group people are mingling, living mixed. In Korea, homogeneous, there were only Koreans. So there were not such kind of discrimination because everybody was poor. But here, in an affluent societies where there are many different ethnic uh, groups are living, there's a clearly discrimination and xenophobia and hatred. This should be stopped in the name of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. One question about, thank you. Yeah, 
just one question and then we open the floor to the audience. Whoever is your successor, he or she, maybe she, what kind of uh, advice would you give him or her? To, uh, just one piece, just one piece yeah, of advice. First of all, the, my successor should be a person of uh, integrity with uh, future-oriented vision, with the passion and compassion. Compassionate leadership is more important at this time, and sense of flexibility, balance, uh, meeting the balancing act between ideals and reality. We have uh, lofty ideals, but you cannot live on lofty ideals always. You have to look how your current situation on the ground are. Therefore, there should be a very a person who can really manage balancing between ideals and reality. I think those are some uh, requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Please raise your hand. The microphone will come to you. Can you see all the Sorry. candidates for the post? And then it's incredible. Please identify yourself just very briefly and ask a question. The lady all the way in the back. Yeah, she's doing it. Her friend is telling her, go ahead. She's, she's not shy because she raised her hand first. Please, we're listening to you. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for making the time to address us today. And thank you for your remarks. My name is Amanda Milani, and I'm a graduate student here at the Institute. Uh, my question is regarding a decision you made in June, which you cited as one of the most difficult during your tenure. Um, the decision to remove Saudi Arabia from a blacklist in the UN Children in Armed Conflict report. My question is, what do you think the impact of that decision has had on the ongoing conflict in Yemen in the past few months, and particularly on the conduct of the armed coalition? Thank you. Okay. That's very difficult answer, a difficult question to answer. Uh, that was one of um, uh, moments when I have to make a very difficult decision. As you know, uh, many uh, hundreds of children were killed. And I have a mandate by the Security Council uh, to protect the civilians, particularly children in armed conflict. And originally, the, the Saudi Arabia was listed. As I said uh, frankly uh, to the world that uh, there was some uh, undue strong political uh, uh, pressure that the name should be lifted. But I didn't lift, I didn't lift the name of Saudi Arabia but with the condition, with the condition that because there was a strong argument that our statistics were based on some wrong information, uh, according to them, uh, while we thought that uh, we were based on very, uh, uh, the, the statistics can not be always correct uh, to the, the exact number of all these people, but we, then in such case, uh, we will temporarily uh, remove this name from the list, but under the condition that you must make sure that you improve. Just let me have your strong commitment, how you are going to handle this matter. Uh, it's uh, being reviewed all the times. Another reason, there is a saying that you cannot burn your hut, you know, house, just to kill a, you know, one bug. Or there are some bugs which needs to be killed. But just to kill bugs, you cannot burn your house. So I cannot burn, destroy whole United Nations operation. operation. Uh, that was one of my main reasons. I met uh, even the two weeks ago during General Assembly, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, before the Deputy Crown Prince and Foreign Minister. I made it quite clear, we are reviewing this situation. But unfortunately, still, these uh, attacks, bombings are continuing. So we have, I have given strong warning uh, the, on this matter. Yeah. Thank you. Another question? Uh, sir, right, right there. All right. 
Please. Thank you. Thank you for your words, Mr. Secretary General. So I could think of a thousand questions to ask, but um, given that um, some of us here are students and uh, you spoke very well about youth and how we have to do much more for youth, my question is, uh, when will... My name is Renzo, I'm a, I'm a student here at the Grad Institute. So given that we are students here, uh, how we have to do much more for young people. So my question is, when will the UN address its unjust and paid internship policy? I don't know if that was a question, but we're really expecting your answer, sir. Yeah. <laughs> now that that happened in Geneva, I understand. It, it, that's why. I mean, uh, <laughs> I hope you are, you are not uh, one of them. But, you know, I... <coughs> Apparently, yes. I <laughs> sympathize with that. But you should, you should really understand, you know, I'm not trying to make any excuse or explanations. The United Nations has a long-held um, uh, system or position that so we do not provide any financial support to the interns. The interns are normally supported by sending organizations or sending governments. Because of a lack of funding, the member states are very strict, very strict. They do not pay any additional uh, money except this assessed contribution and peacekeeping operations. So it's a very tough. Therefore, we don't have uh, these sources. Uh, then mostly, uh, mostly, they come with a sort of some scholarships from the universities or companies or government. That's what we have been doing many decades, many decades. I know that. Uh, I myself have been feeling sorry for all these circumstances. But even with all these demonstrations and in Geneva and elsewhere, we have not been able to improve the situation. That's a real reality which I'm facing. I hope you will understand. But could we have I'll more continue compassion? To continue could, to, yeah, of course. Could we have more compassion for the interns that have passion? That's a member. <laughs> Member states should show more compassion. Thank you. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, another question, sir, right there. Yeah, with the sunglasses. You have the floor. Identify Hi. yourself, please. I'm Tatsuhiro. Um, I'm actually um, a family member of the VISA program that he spoke of. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, with John F. Kennedy, he mentioned earlier. Um, I really don't want to take much time, but I really had to ask this about the P5 earlier. Um, I feel like we actually visited the UN today, and um, we're jokingly, I was sp speaking with somebody um, about, you know, maybe what if all these discussions weren't happening, maybe the world would just naturally become a better place. Um, that was with some joke to it, but um, after hearing that, um, those comments earlier, do you think, this can be just a yes or no, do you think the system, the entire system can be changed, perhaps. Like maybe the P5, five nations, it seems like oh. it's, um, it makes it easier for a grid, uh, like a deadlock. Thank you. So. I, I hope, uh, I hope there'll be a reform of uh, how to dealing with this uh, P5. But as you know, a P5, they were uh, created as a result of Second World War, they were the mostly the victors uh, uh, after the Second World War. Then United Nations was created after the failure of League of Nations, which was not able to pre prevent Second World War. Then at that time, the drafters of this uh, constitution, I mean charter, that's the United Nations Constitution. They might have thought that uh, instead of uh, sharing and spreading, spreading all these powers, then all those key P5 should have certain 
prerogatives to stop this war from happening, then this veto power sometimes has been used for political purposes. That everybody knows. Unfortunately, then there have been a lot of um, talks and negotiations to reform the Security Council. Considering what had happened during the last six decades, seven decades, then Security Council should be reformed on a more democratic, transparent, and representative way. There have been a lot of proposals been made, all very good, reasonable proposals, but again, member states have proposed these ideas all solely based on their national interest. You mean there's no consensus at all? No that. consensus. Okay. No consensus. 20 years negotiation, no consensus at all. Okay. That's a problem. Yeah. Sir, time is running out, and uh, I would want a last question, lady, all the way back in the back row, please. Sorry, we couldn't listen to you for another two hours, but I think your staff will be mad, so we'll be careful. Please, go ahead. Where is she? Yes. Hey, thank you very much. Um, my question is regarding violations. Just tell us your name. Uh, <laughs> yes, sorry. My name is Mariana. I'm student, second year uh, here in the graduate. My question is regarding violations of IHL. I was wondering how could the UN um, better support the workers on the field to avoid <clears throat> attacks to hospitals, ambulances, and... Yeah, you well, are using avoiding uh, the some, violations. Uh, you are using <laughs> some you. very professional term, IHL, but uh, IHL stands international humanitarian laws yeah? or international human rights laws. But you you seem to talk about international human humanitarian laws. This is the basic principle and that uh, all all the people, you know, whatever differences or whatever crisis there may be, all the effort should be based on international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Because of the disregard of these basic norms, we have seen so many people. That's why we've been taking this as number one priority. You must have read my statement all the times international humanitarian law. This is a violation. And violation of international humanitarian law, killing civilian population as a weapon of war, or sexual violence as a weapons of war, this uh, tantamount to uh, in crimes against humanity. Sometimes crimes, war crimes. There were some cases that I asked the Security Council to refer these violations of IHL to the International Criminal Court, but Security Council has not been able to do that. For example, I have repeatedly urged the Security Council to refer this case of Syrian perpetrators to criminal court, International Criminal Court, ICC, but no decision, no decision. So, I'm again repeating and urging those leaders who have power to strictly abide by international humanitarian law. So thank you very much. Thank you. Just one last question. I ask you to answer by yes or no. Would you apply for that job once again? <laughs> if, that, if you were 10 years back, would you ap still apply for the job? <laughs> yes, yes, or no? yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Merci. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général. Merci, merci aux trois or puissances organisatrices, le Forum le Suisse de politique étrangère. Merci à l'Institut des hautes études internationales et du développement. Merci au Club diplomatique de Genève. Vous pouvez recevoir cette session sur le site, bien sûr, de IHEID. Merci à toutes et à tous. Bonne soirée. Au revoir.